my uh, my screen. So let's do this and this. Can you see um, uh, yes. my slide? Perfect. I will just put this down here. All right. Um, welcome everyone uh, to our seminar on value of information analysis in the health economic evaluation. And thank you so much for, for the invitation. Um, so my name is Natalia Kins. Um, as Claire already said, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at uh, Harvard Medical School and Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Institute. I'm also a research affiliate at Yale University. And I'm a um, founding member of Collaborative Network for Value of Information Convoy. And Convoy is an international group of uh, 19 researchers working on VOI analysis. We um, publish uh, work to support the use of uh, VOI. We also organize some educational sessions on VOI. And we have a website with key resources um, for value of information. And before we start, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues and collaborators for some of the materials that I will be using. All right, so let's start with a brief overview of implementation and information decisions. Uh, cost effectiveness analysis involves a number of steps. Uh, more specifically, we start with determining the total expected discounted cost and benefits of uh, each strategy. Uh, we uh, eliminate strategies that are dominated either strongly or weakly. As the next step, we compute incremental cost effectiveness ratios for non dominated strategies. And finally, we apply a willingness to pay threshold for additional quality or other health effects, uh, which we denote lambda here. And we choose the strategy with the highest incremental cost effectiveness ratio that is below our willingness to pay threshold. Uh, in our example, the cost effective strategy is the strategy B with its ISER of $25,000 per quality. Equivalently, one can use net benefit. Here we can use either net monetary benefit or net health benefit. So for each strategy, net monetary benefit involves the quality from the strategy multiplied by the willingness to pay threshold net of the cost. And the decision role with uh, uh, net benefit uh, is to choose the strategy with the highest net benefit. Uh, the role is equivalent to the ICER uh, role from the previous slide. And so the optimal strategy in our example is also strategy B. And this approach is very powerful when analyzing heterogeneity and uncertainty among multiple strategies as is often the case with the evaluation of uh, diagnostic uh, tests. And um, we can define um, a net benefit uh, as a function of intervention denoted here T, um, values of all relevant parameters denoted theta, and our willingness to pay threshold denoted uh, lambda. In reality, when we are doing uh, a cost effectiveness analysis in public health and medicine, we select the treatment that maximizes expected uh, net benefit. Here, I will be talking mostly in net monetary benefits. Uh, however, there is uncertainty in the estimated expected net uh, benefits, and it is caused by the uncertainty in parameters theta. So what does uncertainty in parameters theta mean? Theta is a vector of uh, quantities representing population means um, for the relevant population, such as probabilities, utilities, costs, relative risks etc. Uh, and our uncertainty about theta comes from the fact that we cannot measure the quantities perfectly for the entire population. So this is the second order uncertainty that is standard error of the mean. And when we talk about uncertainty in parameters, we mean parameters such as uh, disease prevalence or incidence, rates of disease progression and other events, um, intervention efficacy, health rated quality of life, uh, weight, cost, uh, and, uh, and other 
And often the uncertainty surrounds both mean values and the variances surrounding those means. So we have a large number of different input parameters and point estimates for these input parameters taken from various sources. And we need to use a mathematical model to simulate the decision problem and obtain, obtain the results. Consequently, we need an analysis that would propagate uncertainty from the input parameters to the outcomes of the model. The analysis we use is a probabilistic analysis, also called a prob probabilistic sensitivity analysis. And here um, we, and here uh, with the prior with the prior um, uncertainty in the parameters, we perform a probabilistic analysis to answer the question about what fraction of the samples from the prior uh, is each intervention or strategy considered optimal or Alternatively, how uncertain we, um, we are that the treatment we choose as optimal on expectation is the optimal treatment in reality. Um, if a single strategy is always the cost-effective strategy at a given willingness to pay threshold, then we are not uncertain about our choice, um, even given current imperfect information. On the other hand, if several different strategies appear to be the cost-effective options uh, at relatively high frequencies, then we are much less certain about the optimal strategies since we do not know which parameter values are the true actual values. Uh, that is, our prior uncertainty makes us uncertain about the optimal intervention. And we'll now take a quick look at uh, how we perform our probabilistic analysis. So uh, we start with generating, uh, generating M um, PA iterations from uncertainty distribution of theta. Uh, here we assume that we have four input parameters, theta one to theta uh, four, uh, and we have three different, um, three different treatment options, T1 to T3. Next, for each iteration, we compute net monetary benefit for each treatment given our willingness to pay threshold lambda as we did here. We then estimate an average net monetary benefit, it's not here, uh, for each treatment and identify the optimal treatment on expectation. We can see that in our example, it is treatment two that provides the highest net monetary benefit on average and is the optimal treatment on expectation. Next, we determine the optimal treatment for each iteration. As we can see, even though strategy T2 is the optimal on average, as we can see it here, it is not always a strategy two that is the optimal in each iteration. Sometimes it is uh, treatment three and sometimes it is treatment uh, one. For example, here we can see that it's treatment three, here it was treatment one. And we use these results to estimate fraction of times each of the treatments or strategies represents the optimal strategy. These results presented in, uh, in the table can be graphed in form of a cost-effectiveness acceptability uh, curve. Here I present cost-effectiveness acceptability curves for each strategy and uh, cost-effectiveness acceptability frontier, um, which indicates the strategy with the highest net monetary benefit. Importantly, we should notice that the strategy that is the optimal on average may not be the strategy with the highest probability of uh, being the optimal. For example, one strategy can be optimal more often but the difference in the net monetary benefit can be very small, while the, the other strategy may be, the, uh, may be optimal less often. But once it is the optimal strategy, then the difference is in the net monetary benefit may be large, increasing its average net monetary benefit. You can see it here in the example that, for example, in um, the iteration nine, the net monetary benefit of treatment two was uh, 769, and the net monetary benefit of treatment three was a bit lower, just uh, uh, 753. But for uh, in the iteration eight, for example, it was uh, treatment three that ha had higher net monetary benefit, 
and the difference between treatment two and treatment uh, three was uh, much larger. It was almost 1,000. And um, uh, yeah, and in this um, in in this case, we are uh, even though um, even though the treatment tool has the highest um, number of uh, uh, is most often the optimal uh, strategy. It doesn't lead to uh, the highest uh, net monetary benefit on the average. Consequently, as we can see at the graph, uh, at some willingness to pay threshold, the cost effectiveness accessibility frontier is not placed on the strategy with the highest probability of cost effectiveness. So even though strategy two has the highest probability of cost effectiveness, it is the strategy uh, three that uh, is the optimal strategy because it provides the highest net benefit on expectation for this uh, tool uh, willingness to pay threshold. Okay. So we can see that in uh, economic evaluation, we have to often deal with decision uncertainty since a cost effectiveness analysis is usually performed using a decision analytic model informed with imperfect evidence. Consequently, the important question to ask here is about the probability of making the wrong decision that is choosing the suboptimal option and about the consequences if uh, we indeed make the wrong decision. And making the wrong decision means either higher costs, foregone benefits, or both. So a value of information analysis helps evaluate if the expected value of more evidence on the consequences of intervention outweigh the cost of obtaining that evidence, including the foregone health benefits while awaiting the information. Furthermore, quantifying uncertainty in the decision made using currently available evidence can help assess the value of gathering additional evidence to improve decision-making and reduce the expected costs of uncertainty. And VOI analysis is used to evaluate decision uncertainty, assess the need for further research and identify the optimal designs of that research. And there are several measures that we can distinguish in the VOI analysis as uh, presented on this uh, diagram. And as we move down on this level, we can see that the practical use of the obtained results increases, but at the same time, the computational is decreases. First, we start with the expected value of perfect information. And EVPI provides information about the value of eliminating the uncertainty from all models parameters. So it helps us to evaluate how much better we could do if we eliminated all sources of uncertainty for all parameters. And this represents our maximum willingness to pay to get perfect information on all input parameters. Okay, so let's take a look at a simple illustration of the EVPI. I think this uh, um, example is, illustrates very nicely EVPI and I would like to acknowledge my mentor, David Paltiel for, uh, for this example. All right, so let's take a look at this um, example here. We assume that uh, we have two drugs which are available to treat a hypothetical condition that afflicts young people aged 20. And drug A leaves patients with a 40 year life expectancy and patients who respond to drug B enjoy a 60 year life expectancy. However, patients who do not respond to drug B face a 30 year life expectancy. And we can, we can illustrate it as a, a decision, simple decision tree. For drug A, uh, we always have a life expectancy of uh, 40 and life expectancy for drug B depends on patient's responsiveness, um, which we denote P uh, to the drug. And we can uh, state it as, uh, as here. So we see that it's 30 plus 30 P. So it depends on uh, our responsiveness, the uh, patient's responsiveness. We can present it, um, we can present the choice of the clinical strategy as a function of the responsiveness to drug B. And if probability of responsiveness to drug B is lower than 0.33, we would choose drug A. 
because it leads to higher uh, life expectancy. And if the probability of responsiveness would be higher than 0.33, we would choose drug B because this uh, drug leads to higher life expectancy. At the point of uh, 0.33, we are indifferent between the two strategies. Now, suppose that we uh, that there was a perfect test to predict patient's response to drug B. How would you use this information and what would it be worth uh, to you? So let's go back to our decision tree. We had drug A and drug, uh, drug B arms. And now we have a third arm test. And if the test says response, uh, we know that we should give drug B to the patient because it leads to higher life, uh, life expectancy, as we can see here. However, if uh, the test says uh, not respond, then we give uh, patient drug, uh, drug A because that's the, uh, that drug leads to higher life expectancy. And we can write it as then 40 plus 20p, and for the other two arms, it stays as it was. So previously, we had this situation where we chose uh, the treatment depending on the uh, probability of responsiveness to drug B. And now we have the perfect test, which will always tell us which treatment we should uh, provide to the patient. And this means that we would gain this area between the perfect test, which is the dashed line, um, and the drug A, if the, uh, if the P is lower than 0.33, um, or drug B, if the probability of responsiveness is higher than 0.23. Um, and at the probability of responsiveness um, below 0.33, uh, we take the value of our test, which was 40 plus 20p, and we subtract the value of drug A, and that gives us 20, 20p. Then uh, above, uh, at the probability above 0.33, we take the value of the test, and we subtract the value of the drug B, what we did before we had the perfect test. And this gives us uh, the result of uh, 3.33. And what does our result mean? It means that perfect information on the response of patients to drug B could increase life expectancy by 3.33 years. And we can also express this result in monetary terms and say that such uh, willingness to pay threshold, say, of $50,000 for uh, additional life year gained, uh, the EVPI would be um, $167. Thousand uh, dollars per patient. So to estimate uh, EVPI, we use net benefits to identify the optimal strategy and calculate losses associated with choosing that strategy. And we want to answer the question how much better we could do on expectation if we eliminated all sources of uncertainty uh, for all input parameters. And we can present it as a box that represents our decision analytic model here and consists here of five different input parameters. With EVPI, we estimate the value of eliminating all uncertainty from all input parameters in our model. So from all input parameters here. And although EVPI sounds theoretical because it is in practice not feasible to, uh, to collect perfect information, it provides the maximum value that can be gained by collecting additional information. In other words, no future data collection should ever cost more than uh, the EVPI value. Next, we move to the expected value of partial perfect information. And EVPI provides us with information on how much of the model uncertainty is caused by particular parameters or subsets of parameters. So EVPI helps us to learn where we should target research, what input parameters we should focus on. And in our simple example that I presented uh, before with drug A and B, EVPI was equal to EVPI because we had only one input parameter in our model. If the responsiveness to drug B would be one of several input parameters, 
uh, then the results that we obtained is 3.33 years would be our KPA result because then we would be focusing only on one input parameters among uh, many other input parameters of our model. So while with EVPI, we estimate the value of eliminating all uh, uncertainty from all input parameters in our model, with EVPI, we estimate the value of eliminating all uncertainty from selected input parameters in our model. And if it PPI is already more informative because it helps identify input parameters that should be targeted in future research, but it still makes strong assumptions about the data collection. More specifically, it assumes that the data collection would come from a, an infinitely large sample size, which is in practice not feasible. Consequently, we move to the last BOI measure, the expected value of sample information. So the EVPI presents the value of eliminating uncertainty and the EVPI of reducing uncertainty, assuming that additional research would collect data from infinitely large sample size, which is not feasible in practice. We just further need to estimate the potential benefits of collecting additional information from the proposed studies using a range of finite sample sizes, which is more informative to, for decision makers. This is performed with uh, the expected value of sample information, EBSI, which measures the value of information that may be obtained by conducting a specific research study using different um, finite sample sizes. In other words, it shows the value of reducing the uncertainty. So EBSI is estimated using Bayesian statistics by using our prior uh, incorporated in the model, we simulate new data collection and obtain our posterior. And as eliminating uncertainty can only be achieved with an infinitely large sample, um, expected value of sample information is generally more informative and may play an essential role in designing a new research study and in research prioritization. Okay. So let's go back to our example, but now forget about the perfect test. Instead, suppose that we are offered the opportunity to observe responsiveness to drug B of one patient. And this will tell us something about population responsiveness to drug B. So the question is what this uh, imperfect sample information is worth to us. And EVSI, unlike EVPI, does not yield a numeric answer for probability of responsiveness, rather additional information which influences our probability density for P, uh, that is the probability of responsiveness. And this happens through Bayesian updating, so we uh, still define our prior for P, but instead of finding out P with certainty, we gain some information about P. We can use this, uh, that information to generate a new distribution for P, our posterior. And we should notice that there are a large number of possible posterior distributions depending on what we observe in the trial. And one possible posterior distribution is beta. And in this distribution parameters, alpha and beta can be thought of as counts where alpha represents successes and beta represents failures. And this makes fitting the beta distribution very straightforward. Uh, if either the number of successes and failures is known or alternatively, if a proportion of and total sample size are given. So let's start with beta one one implying a uniform distribution and an expected value of uh, probability of uh, responsiveness P equal to 0.5. Okay, so as before, the expected value of drug A is always 40, and it does not depend on, uh, on P, on the probability of uh, responsiveness. And in the absence of any information other than our beta with alpha and beta uh, equal to one, prior probability distribution, the expected value of P is 0.5. And when we use uh, this uh, P equal 0.5, the expected value of, um, of drug B uh, is 45. And it is higher the expected value of uh, drug A, which was 40. Um, so drug B is the preferred choice. 
Now, suppose that we can observe the responsiveness of a single member of the population to drug B. And the additional information can be used to update our beta uh, prior with uh, probability 0.5, the posterior width uh, will be beta to one, implying estimated mean value of uh, probability 0.67. So one, this patient would uh, respond here. And with prob probability 0.5, the posterior will be uh, beta uh, one, two, um, assuming that uh, the patient would not respond and then implying estimated mean value of B equal uh, 0.33. And we can present it in form of a table. The first row here, uh, is when the patient was uh, responsive. So we see that the estimated mean for, uh, for P is 0.67 and the expected value for uh, drug B is 50, uh, which is higher than the expected value for drug, uh, drug A. The second row, row is um, when patient was not responsive. And so the est estimated mean of P is 0.33 and the expected value for drug B is 40 as we can see here. And given that, that even when patient is not responsive, the expected value of, uh, of a drug B is not lower than the expected value of drug, uh, drug A, there is no value in this additional information that uh, we can see in this estimation uh, here because drug B remains the preferred choice no matter, no matter what the outcome of the trial. So this additional information would not change our, um, our decision. And if the sample size of our trial is two, we have three different potential outcomes of the trial. In the first row, um, uh, two new patients responded, giving three patients that responded and one that did not, uh, did not respond. In total, so the estimated mean uh, P is 0.75 and the expected value for drug B is 52.5, which is higher than the expected value for drug A. Second, uh, in the second row, one uh, patient responded and one did not respond, giving the estimated mean P of uh, 0.50 and the expected value of uh, drug B 45. And the third row where the two new patients did not respond, as we can see here, um, which updates our prior and gives the estimated mean uh, for P of uh, 0.25 and the expected value for drug B of uh, 37.5. And we should notice here that the third outcome would cause the preference to switch to drug A because the expected value of uh, drug A is higher than the expected value of drug B. So now the optimal decision depends on the outcome of the trial. And therefore, as we can see in the equation here, the information will have value. So to sum up uh, the results of our example, the EVSI of a trial with uh, one additional patient was equal to zero because it would not change our decision. But the EVSI of a trial with two patients was already positive. To determine if such trial would be worthwhile, we would need to take into consideration the cost of, uh, of the research, a um, topic that uh, we'll come back to shortly. But we can see that this additional information could change our decision, and so it, uh, uh, it had value. And as a reminder, the value of, uh, that could be gained with perfect information, that is the maximum value of additional information was 3.33 years. And importantly, as the sample size in our EVSI increases and reaches infinity, the value of EVSI uh, approaches the value of uh, uh, the expected uh, uh, the EV PPI because the EV PPI assumes an infinitely large sample size. And the gold standard to estimate EVSI is a nested Monte Carlo simulation based uh, estimation method for the inner expectation, which is very computationally intensive. Fortunately, quite recently, four methods have been proposed to approximate this inner expectation with lower computational costs. 
And this part of convoy, we compared and assessed the accuracy and computational time required for each method. We also provided practical guidance and recommendations to help inform the choice between four efficient EDSI estimation methods. And uh, you can find this work in the papers provided here. So to summarize with EPPI, we estimate the value of eliminating all uncertainty from all input parameters in our model. With EPPI, we estimate the value of eliminating all uncertainty, but only from specific input parameters in our model or subsets of input parameters. And finally, with EVSI, we estimate the value of reducing uncertainty by collecting additional information using finite sample sizes on specific input parameters in our model. And finally, in our estimations, we should take into account the cost of research. And uh, we do that by estimating the expected net benefit of sampling, which represents the marginal benefit of collecting additional information to reduce the uncertainty when considering the cost of further research. And the expected net benefit of sampling um, with, uh, with ENDS, we can uh, identify the optimal sample size at the point where ENDS reaches its uh, highest value. Furthermore, it is important to extrapolate the VOI results to a population level. Um, we have to always do that by multiplying the VOI results with the number of people who would benefit from um, additional research each year assumed over the time horizon of the decision and we, uh, we have to also discount it uh, appropriately. So to sum up with EVPI, we want to answer the question whether we should collect more evidence. With EVPI, we aim to answer the question about what evidence we should collect. And with EVSI, we want to answer the question how we should design the study. All right. That was all I wanted to present, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or any. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you so much. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. Um, the first question is from Kate, and she asks, uh, so which type of analysis do you think are then feasible for different contexts? Are they equally feasible for analyzing a population-wide policy, or are they more suitable to do, as you just said, uh, analysis into pharmacological treatments? Um, I wonder what, uh, which type of analysis uh, does she? Uh, well, uh, yes, I'm not so sure. Who, yeah, I, I mean, EVPI, EVPI, or EVSI, or yes, yes. Well, um, so I would say like VSI is something that provides like something that we, that is the best to do because it's the most realistic because it's, uh, it assumes not only in VSI, we not only select uh, specific input parameters, which is more like realistic what we would do in a, in a research trial, but we also assume specific uh, finite sample sizes. Um, however, given that it's more um, that it's more difficult to uh, compute, it's more computational expensive. Sometimes you can already see at the point of EVPI whether the value of uh, this perfect information that we would gain is higher than the cost of research. Because if you compare already at that point and you see that actually. Uh, when running your analysis, you see that there is not much decision uncertainty because there is some value, but this value is lower than we would need to pay for that trial. Like we know that it's better to just go ahead with the decision now and uh, do not collect more information from a decision making point or like cost effectiveness analysis point of view, because sometimes some trials can be uh, valuable from like clinical point of view. Mm -hmm. Um, and another question that we have is how do we deal, because I guess that all these value of information analysis in their own right, they will also have some level of uncertainty. Yeah. So I think that this is just like another layer of uncertainty and how do you like deal with that? Like when we present, for example, the expected value of perfect information, how sure 
uh, we are of the results. Well, so that's a very good point. And so I think like to be sure that VOI is uh, estimated appropriately, we BOI depends on many factors and we need to first of all be sure that our model has been developed uh, properly that the input parameters are uh, good and are their distributions uh, are informed uh, properly as well so like we have to be sure about all of those uh, uncertainty points i would say and this is like and I think that can be difficult to evaluate very often because that depends on, on the authors and like moderators. Mm -hmm. um, and other than that, um, like we can estimate some uncertainty also in our results and see how, um, what is the, the uncertainty well, uh, in the, um, or thunders here. <laughs> um, yeah, what is the uncertainty in our results? But I would say like the most important is the model and the input parameters and those and to make sure that uh, BOI is um, is um, conducted properly. Mm -hmm. And that can be perhaps difficult sometimes to uh, process because it's very like based on cost effectiveness analysis. So if something wrong, if, if, if there is something wrong with the model or with our cost effectiveness analysis, it will also be in uh, oh, in BOI. Um, oh, okay, I see. Because it's based on, so it's you first do like a cost effectiveness analysis. So it's very mm -hmm. based on that. If something wrong is there, then like this VOI will not present the um, result, the, the, the decision uncertainty properly. Right. Mm. Okay, uh, that was my question. I don't know if anyone else uh, has any questions for Natalia. I think that was it. Uh, Dr. Kams, right. thank you so much for joining thank today. You. It was very informative and I think it's a very interesting topic. Um, and I have seen that it's growing in the literature. So it was I really like this topic. So if there are any questions, <laughs> I think just reach out to me. I have provided also my uh, email address. So yeah, I'm always happy to talk about VOI <laughs> and yeah. other topics as well. But <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye.